Okay, welcome everyone. Um, so let's begin with some terminology. Um, so geoengineering is a generic form, a uh, generic term referring to an intentional large scale manipulation of climate processes in order to offset global warming effects. So this would include uh, such things as, as melting of Arctic sea ice and the cryosphere. It may be contrasted then with efforts to restrict CO2 emissions in the first place. Uh, geoengineering is a term that is not uh, preferred, I think is the, is the word for, for the IPCC. They, like, they think it's been used uh, in various ways in the, in the literature, and so they like more specific terms. Uh, but we'll just use geoengineering here as, as this generic uh, over, overarching term. So one type of geoengineering then would be solar radiation modification or SRM. That's a term that we'll be using a lot today. That refers to a variety of proposed approaches to reduce the amount of sunlight that reaches the surface. Uh, stratospheric aerosol injection is one uh, type of SRM. Uh, that refers to the application of small particles or aerosols in the upper atmosphere at middle and high latitudes to cool the planet via global dimming or increased atmospheric albedo. Uh, so modeling studies of SRM have been conducted pretty much since uh, climate models have been, uh, have been introduced. Uh, there's, there's a long record of, of numerical experiments associated with, with SAI. Uh, some of these results are summarized in reports by the National Academies of Sciences has a uh, detailed report on SRM. Uh, also in the uh, most recent IPCC AR6 report in the physical science basis, there's about 11 pages in, in chapter four, which is a good summary. Uh, another place that has a good summary is the 22, 2022 uh, ozone sciences report. Um, so in 2020, this uh, research into SRM came into the uh, preview of the, uh, the purview of the um, of federal research, the US Congress mandated research into SRM focused under a NOAA program. Uh, Congress also mandated an executive branch research plan. Uh, this plan was released in June of last year. So it called for expanded research into SRM. It uh, described uh, the types of SRM that would fall under federal research. So these include uh, stratospheric aerosol injection, uh, it would also include uh, marine stratocumulus brightening, or MCB. That would be the brightening of aerosol of of clouds uh, to reflect more more sunlight. Um, it also indicated types of SRM that were not part of federal research. So space-based mirrors, space-based uh, shades are not part of federal research. Um, local albedo modification is also not part of of the federal of this federal research plan. Um, it seeks a comparative risk assessment relative to climate change effects and identifies uh, relevant federal agencies. Uh, there's uh, some text in it uh, about um, uh, a statement on environmental justice and uh, research governance. Um, it also identifies the USGCRP as the best suited entity uh, to lead research. Uh, it's my understanding that the USGCRP is is or uh, has been conducting a survey of agencies to to understand uh, their activities associated with geoengineering and SRM. Uh, so the the modeling co leads have discussed this at at some length. So SRM research is not mentioned in the federal research plan. Nevertheless, there are aspects of the plan that uh, overlap with. Um, with S with uh, SRM research. So for example, uh, in the biannual implementation plan, there's a, a point uh, associated with the surface energy budget as a focus of research. And I think we can identify several other uh, points in the biannual implementation plan where uh, SRM research would be consistent with, um, with um, progress towards points in the biannual implementation plan. So th there's a lot of overlap, I think, you know, uh, there's clearly, this comes under uh, um, the mandate then for IARPIC, or, or we should at least be discussing this topic. So we would like to under, better understand, you know, this nexus of SRM research, Arctic research and modeling. 
and how and uh, and and what the what the overlap is. Um, so potential SRM methods may operate in the Arctic, uh, or they may have specific climate outcomes related to the Arctic. And I think I should have mentioned that the um, uh, the research plan, uh, the federal research plan that was released last year, indicates that uh, they they seek uh, specific uh, specific specificity in um, what the outcomes are of particular activities. Um, so while we will focus today on the research aspects and the modeling aspect, there are activities underway regarding geoengineering ethics and governance for the Arctic. So the Arctic Science Council. Uh, held workshops earlier this year on geoengineering. Uh, they've proposed a white paper on methods targeted uh, targeted for the Arctic. Um, they emphasize needs for inclusive, transparent, and ethically responsible approaches. So the uh, rep U.S. representation for the Arctic Science Council is the, the Polar Research Board. Um, NSF is also currently hosting a series of workshops on ethical and social dynamics of climate intervention technologies. And beyond um, the, these government activities, there are NGO activities uh, that are going on right now. Ocean Visions um, has had some recent meetings and has made some materials available uh, on this topic. Okay, and I think I can stop sharing. And with that, I think we can go to our first speakers then. So Greg Frost is the Atmospheric Composition and Chemistry Liaison in NOAA's Office of Oceanic and Atmospheric Research. Victoria Breeze is with the NOAA Climate Program Office. They are program managers for the NOAA Earth Radiation Budget Initiative. And the title of their presentation is Solar Radiation Modification Research at NOAA. Thanks a lot, Richard. And thanks to all of you for the opportunity to talk with you today. Um, so uh, Victoria is there on the screen. I think you can see her picture. Um, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll start off giving the, the briefing here. We're both here to answer questions and, and discuss with you. Um, so, uh, you know, so uh, this is a mutually produced uh, <laughs> presentation and we're both, uh, you know, both um, happy to be here. So, um, Richard did a really nice job setting up, setting the stage. So you you know you understand the terminology and and the different techniques that are under consideration. Uh, National Academies has had two reports in the past decade on SRM approaches, and I'm going to use SRM as my as is our nomenclature here, solar radiation modification, um, to talk about the you know the broader set of approaches. Um, so National Academies has had two reports on this topic. Um, you know, two full panels, two full reports. Their earlier report that came out in 2015 identified SRM approaches as really the only ways to rapidly cool the planet within years of deployment, um, uh, as opposed to, you know, um, other methods that have been proposed that will take decades or centuries or, or whatever. So um, let's see. Uh, the 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 methods that have been most talked about, as Richard pointed out, SAI, MCB, Cirrus cloud thinning, it's not, it's technically not solar radiation modification. It's it's reducing the amount of long wave radiation escaping back to space, uh, but it's often talked about um, alongside of the, the short wave reduction methods like SAI and MCB. Um, our program um, considers it part of the suite of, of um, approaches that we would um, consider in our, you know, the research that we fund. I will note the National Academies recommended SRM research levels of something like one to $200 million over five years. That was in their, their more recent report uh, from 2021. Um, so why are we involved in this? Well, um, you know, Richard already pointed out, we, we have a mandate from Congress. Um, NOAA has had a mandate in its budget uh, since 2020, fiscal year 2020. So we're on year six of that mandate now. And we've We've essentially gotten the same um, instruction each year from Congress with additional requests for um, <laughs> tasks as they go along. Um, but NOAA is generally interested because this proposed, you know, these proposed methods could do have the potential of reducing climate hazards and preserving critical ecosystems while other mitigation responses like reducing emissions, removing carbon from the atmosphere and other methods um, could be implemented and, and especially methods that are gonna take a while. 
Um, preserving critical ecosystems, more recently, the conversation in this community has increasingly focused on regional approaches, protecting ecosystems like the Arctic, like, like um, coral reefs, et cetera. Um, and those are, I feel like those discussions are happening just as much as the, you know, protect the planet kind of discussions. Um, the schematic on the right kind of gives you the, that's sort of the napkin diagram, if you will, of how um, deployments of SRM are considered. Um, so if, if you have trouble seeing it on your screen, it's just uh, Y axis is global surface temperature, X axis is time and decades, no units, no numbers. Black curve is kind of kind of trajectory of business as usual right now. Um, orange curve would be ex, uh, aggressive mitigation and removal of carbon from the atmosphere. Um, even with those, there is the potential of overshooting a temperature threshold, depending on what the world was aiming at. And so uh, SRM methods have been proposed as a way to shave that peak. So cool the planet a little bit while until the um, curve can bend over and come below the threshold temperatures. So that's the typical way that's that's thought about. Um, of course, the feasibility of these approaches, how they're how effective they are, and all their subsequent downstream impacts are all um, quite uncertain, and they are the the subject of the research that our program is carrying out. Um, so, and of course, we have a mandate as the uh, NOAA has the mandate to understand these also as um, our mission being service. Um, science service and stewardship of the earth system. So there's clearly a need for assessment of the science that underlies SRM. And that's something um, that first of all, our program stands ready to support. Um, this is, there've been growing calls for these sorts of assessment activities. I'd recommend taking a look at this paper that was just published in Oxford Climate Change. Simone Tilms from NCAR with a cast of um, other authors from many institutions wrote a really nice piece on you know, the need for scenarios and strategies that consider um, uh, stratospheric aerosol injection SAI in there. Um, a comprehensive scientific assessment would be one way to gather the state of knowledge for all of these different SRM techniques, not just SAI, and, and really um, what our current understanding scientifically is of the impacts and risks. And, it, you know, this is essentially analogous to what we are already doing with the IPCC process, but, you know, doing this, um, including really SRM as part of that process. So I think, I think there's a real need for that. In order to have any other further discussions, we need to know what we understand about this. Um, some efforts at, that, at, this, at these assessments have, um, have been um, carried out. The ozone assessment, um, ozone assessment report that comes out every four years as part of the obligations towards uh, fulfilling the, the uh, conditions of the Montreal Protocol. The most recent one had a chapter on the impacts of stratospheric aerosol injection on the ozone layer. Uh, UNEP has called for um, uh, research and assessment of SRM. And most recently, the WCRP, which sits under the World Meteorological Organization, um, at, has started two lighthouse, a lighthouse activity focusing both on SRM and CDR. And these, are, these would be the idea there would be to do some of the foundational work towards an assessment process. But to, the, to this date, there is no comprehensive assessment of all SRM techniques um, that is at least an internationally accepted activity. Um, what about our program? So at NOAA, as I said, we've had a mandate now for, for uh, we're going on our sixth year now. We're the only federal agency with an explicit mandate to study SRM foundation, foundational research. Um, we have heavily funded observational capabilities to baseline the atmosphere, particularly the stratosphere. And that's because the stratosphere is relatively undersampled relative to the troposphere. So we funded a suite of instruments that uh, we then deployed on a NASA aircraft. Um, NASA has um, aircraft that can access the strat lower stratosphere. NOAA does not own such aircraft. Um, We've also funded a, a extensive balloon observations, so regular monitoring with weather balloons that include ozone, water vapor, and aerosol uh, packages to build up a climatology of stratospheric aerosols. Uh, we fund a lot of modeling work, um, uh, both looking at, um, you know, what would the potential impacts of SRM be, but but also just understanding aerosols more generally in your system. Um, because a lot of the physics we're talking about here is really key to the predictive systems that NOAA 
uh, is maintaining both for weather and climate. And then we uh, work with other agencies to identify where the research gaps are and, um, you know, help build, build an understanding and support across the agencies. And this is an example, the example on the right is an ex a paper that highlights a workshop that DOE and NOAA co-hosted on marine cloud brightening approaches. So um, I mentioned the field work, this campaign, which we call SABRE, uh, this just kind of highlights that work. So this is this aircraft work flying in the lower stratosphere to characterize the baseline status of trace gases and aerosols. Uh, we always fly, the plane is based in Houston at Johnson Space Center. So we always fly some middle altitude flights and then the researchers take it to different locations around the globe to pick up different parts of the Brewer Dobson circulation. So their first deployment in 2023 targeted the uh, late winter, early spring uh, in the polar, um, you know, uh, in the polar uh, north, you know, the polar regions, uh, Arctic region. Uh, had a lot of interesting results coming out of there um, and happy to talk more about those, but I don't want to take too much time. Um, just about our program, we are funded at the currently at the nine and a half million dollar level, or we were in 24. We don't have a budget yet for 25. Um, total expenditure uh, by Congress on NOAA for this program has been $41 million in the last five years. Uh, we have a lot of um, partnerships across the country now, a lot of academic institutions funded either directly or through extramural grants. Um, uh, we have partnerships, as I said, with NASA, DOE. Um, and um, um, the, we have an active competitive grants program. So we're on our third set of um, our third solicitation and um, Victoria is a program manager for that. Uh, we are still welcoming proposals for that. They are due in December. Uh, so um, you are welcome to take a look at these links after the fact and uh, take a look at those calls. Um, one more reason why NOAA is really interested in these in SRM approaches is that we are the agency to which you must report your activities to modify the weather if you are doing it on U.S. soil. Um, that is a 50-year-old law. Uh, and if you read that, read the letter of that law, it actually includes SRM in there. Not those words, but any modification of the atmosphere composition with the intention of modifying weather. Well, if you try, if you modify climate, you are modifying weather. So uh, by definition, SRM is included. So this is our method for collecting information about U.S. activity on SRM. We have had a few entities report to us. Um, if you don't report, we can fine you, although we have not done so yet. <laughs> um, Richard mentioned, you mentioned the OSTP plan uh, already, Richard. So I encourage you to take a look at that if you've not already. That was published a year ago. NOAA is currently at work on its own research agenda for this. This was part of the instructions from Congress last year, actually the last two years that we write our own research agenda. We have based that agenda on the OSTP research agenda. Um, our explicit direction from Congress was to focus on the physical science aspects of this research, um, support scientific assessments, as I mentioned. We were also asked to help um, identify detection capabilities for SRM, particularly unannounced attempts at it. So we have um, tried to do some of that. We've gotten, um, we provide guidance on our own, how we would govern any SRM research that we support. Um, and um, right, uh, we are in the clearance process for that agenda. Um, it takes a very long time. If anybody has ever been involved with submitting something to Congress, it, it's not a quick process. So uh, I expect we'll be doing this for a while longer, but when we do submit it, um, our intention is to make that agenda public. So that will be our public facing document as well. In the meantime, I'd encourage you to take a look at the website that I was on that earlier slide there for our program. And we, we talk a lot about the research we do there. So um, just wanted to mention that, that while we are the only ones with an explicit direction to go do this research, we have partnerships with DOE, NSF, um, NASA, um, on for in, on various respects. Um, we talk a lot to the State Department, um, who is involved in climate negotiations. And of course, we were contributors to the OSTP research plan. And last thing is, I want to just leave you with the understanding of the urgency of this research. So um, the U.S. is not the only government that is um, transparent about funding this research. Uh, the United Kingdom and Australia have been funding this work. Um, uh, the United Kingdom's ARIA program, which is kind of similar to DARPA, 
has a $75 million call out right now, and they are encouraging a small scale experiment um, uh, to be one of, to, you know, as a proposal. Um, we already talked about the international space. There are a ton of philanthropic um, private, you know, funding mechanisms for research in this space. Those also fund a number of NGOs. Some of these you've probably heard of, including uh, Silver Lining, which funded the, which then in turn funded the University of Washington to conduct a marine cloud brightening experiment, a test of technology for marine cloud brightening in San Francisco uh, Bay. And then there are two, at least two entities that are hoping to somehow make money off of SRM. So um, the amount of money being spent on this far exceeds what the US government is now spending. So that's part of our urgency and our concern is that, that um, we don't want to see testing going on outside of, you know, in the atmosphere and not know about it or have it be done willy nilly or whatever. So, um, and I will say we are not, we, NOAA is not funding any experiment where we test anything in the atmosphere. We're not introducing aerosols in the atmosphere. We're not doing any of that. We're doing the fundamental research, but um, that doesn't mean that others might not. So a few ideas up there for things we might want to discuss. I'm happy to put this up later again, and also provided our contact info. We are, Victoria and I are more than happy to talk with anybody here uh, if you'd like to talk to us you know, uh, after the fact here. And certainly we welcome conversation today. So I think I'll leave it there, Richard, so that Ava has some time to speak. And I, I know I went a little over, so apologies. No, that's fine. Thanks very much, Greg and, and Victoria. So if you'd like to ask a question, uh, you could raise your hand. I believe the hand is now under the uh, React button in Zoom. So you could raise your hand and then I could call on you to, to ask a question. I can warm us up to start with a few IARPIC type questions. I think you've kind of address some of this. Do you feel that your program has a focus on the Arctic? I guess specifically uh, in your, your call for request for proposals, do you, do you mention the Arctic or, or is that a, uh, or is it just more of a, a generic aspect? It's more generic. Um, we have not, we have not explicitly focused on the Arctic. Um, in part, that's because again, our, our, our um, work is trying to kind of fund the, the fundamental science understanding of feasibility, efficacy, and impacts of, this, of these techniques. So whether they're taking place in the Arctic or globally or in some other region of the world, um, we're still trying to understand those, those basic impacts. That said, um, if proposals are submitted that are focused specifically in Arctic, they'd be welcome. It's just that we haven't we haven't framed our calls that way. Um, Victoria, I should let you have a chance to speak since you're the <laughs> officer no, managing that program. So yeah. You've pretty much covered it. And I'll just add our current funding call is focused on integrating observations and modeling and supportive process understanding. And so since the newest batch of observations includes our Sabre Field campaign, which took place in the Arctic last year, by you know design, that will include a very Arctic focused uh, data set, but it's not again a, a requirement or a sole focus. And okay. and our next the next saber deployment will will definitely not be in the Arctic. It'll be uh, somewhere quite a bit warmer, probably. <laughs> um, so um, so we're you know it's not that we're only focused there. They happened to go there first because of the timing. It was a good chance to kind of sample air that was quite old, descending through the Arctic vortex. Um, coming from dark into light, you know, as the polar spring was coming on. So that was really the purpose of going there then. Um, okay. Mike McCracken, um, if you could unmute and, and welcome. Um, okay. So I'm retired or I'd be submitting a proposal, but I, <laughs> I, I have a, a, a question to ask because I'd like to see somebody do it. And your office, Greg, would, might be one that would do it. And that has to do with cirrus cloud thinning. Yeah. Now, it, it's hard to think of it as something to really affect the global scale thing. But if you could clear the cirrus clouds that are over the ice sheets in the winter and let the uh, IR out more greatly and chill the ice sheets down so they were better to withstand the summer, uh, the summer heat, that would be a very valuable kind of thing to do. Um, I mean, I, it's interesting that if you go back to the, 
what the climatic optimum or something, you know, 6,000 years ago, solar radiation in the summer was 7% greater than it is now. Um, and, and stuff. So there was a lot of heat going on to the ice sheets, but they weren't really melting back much. And that was might well be because during the cold winters with low CO, lower CO2, they could really chill down. And right. so I guess I'm wondering if it's worth looking at, you know, somebody with some modeling efforts to, to have us a look at how much cirrus there is and whether whether if there were a way to get rid of it, I know there are issues about whether you can do it or not, but if one could get do that, would that help chill the ice sheets and so help you know slow the loss of ice and sea level rise? And so use cirrus cloud thinning for a specific purpose, not to try and cool the whole world and, and offset things, but, but to really reduce ice sheet uh, loss. Um. I'll just say that that sounds within the scope of our program. <laughs> um, Mike, uh, I don't know if it necessarily fits our exact solicitation this current time, but um, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. Certainly, you know, in general, we'd entertain proposals on CCT and, and using it to cool the Arctic. So, um, Victoria, did I, oh, you put something in the chat, sorry. I didn't see that until- Yeah, just that uh, the Arctic actually has become a focus region for yeah. cloud thinning research for that for exactly the reasons Mike listed. So yeah. um some and some of that's where we hear more about like a mixed phase cloud thinning and that sort of work would be that your your keyword to look up there. But yes. So you you should submit a proposal, Mike. I, I wish I were back doing it now, you know. <laughs> Thanks. Mike. Being being retired 20 years, I'm way past that, but find some postdoc or somebody to, you know, or graduate project that it really be an interesting graduate student, you know, project that's really just running, you know, running some model experiments, taking Cirrus out over, over the ice sheets and see if you can do it. Because, I mean, there's basically, if you can get in the, you know, in, in the winter, it's going to chill down until it has no sources of energy. And, it, and the fact that it stays stable and doesn't get colder, is, you know, the, the longer it can go the more heat you get out of those ice sheets and hopefully that they could go through the winter, go through the summer. Yeah, I, it, you know, it's, um, I will say part of the reason why, you know, when we talk about this, we tend to talk about SAI and MCB and then CCT kind of lesser is just that it's really, really hard, right? We don't fully understand cirrus cloud formation itself, let alone how one might perturb it. So I think that's, but obviously a great area for more research, right? So it's a, it's a much more limited area than trying to do the whole Arctic or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, so it just might be intriguing to do mm -hmm. or to investigate, I guess. Thank you. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. And Ralph Kant, Ralph, hello. Yeah, hi. Um, hi, Greg, so. Uh, hey, Jack. I mean, uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, so, so most of the discussion of impacts that I've seen has to do with the global mean surface temperature, because that's yeah. a relatively easy thing to represent. Whereas yeah. when it comes to habitability, the regional temperatures are far more important than the global mean. Yeah. And modeling the regional temperatures is, is much more challenging. And yeah. the impacts of SRM especially uh, are likely not to be targeted regionally in an appropriate way. So, for example, if you reduce the temperature gradient between land and ocean, you kill off the uh, monsoons. Yeah. And there is historical analog for that in that, the, I mean, the, historically, the Nile River flow diminished dramatically at some early historic time when there was a major volcanic eruption that reduced those those uh, temperature gradients. So I'm just wondering how you approach that. Is it being approached? Is it being considered? I mean, I worry that that uh, jumping into the possibility of making changes could do more harm than good. Yeah, so I'll emphasize again, Victoria and I are program managers. We're not performing any of this research ourselves. So, um, but um, uh, this is exactly why there's been decades of modeling studies on exactly the question you're asking. And you're right, the models are can be all over the place on what those impacts are. 
this is definitely an area for more research. Um, and it's definitely one of the big concerns. Um, I mean, there's a host of concerns. I think some of this, the, what's going on in the chat right now is listing what those concerns are, right? And so this is why modeling research is primarily what's being done. The observational research we're funding is really about, let's establish a baseline, particularly in the stratosphere, but to some extent in the marine boundary layer before any of these things ever happen so that we can put some really objective constraints on all of those models, because we all know how difficult it is for an earth system model, right? At the scale that would be needed to do this, to get things right at smaller scales, like at a regional level. And um, so our first and foremost thing is let's, let's put some constraints on those models. If they can't reproduce the current state um, with the observations that we're, you know, that we're helping to support, well, then we're not quite, we're not very sure of their predictive capability. A second aspect is that we're trying to fund research that goes beyond the very large scale models and goes down, you know, uh, tries to go down to smaller scales. Um, I mean, we have, we do fund work at very small scales with like large eddy simulation, but, um, but in between that, you know, for example, for example, like dynamical downscaling techniques, um, you know, forcing a, a regional model with some sort of forcing and then looking at the impacts there. So a variety of those kinds of studies um, encourage you, um, we can put the link to our website, I encourage you to take a look at some of the projects for funding. But certainly these are the, all the kinds of studies that are within scope of our, of our program and happy to, happy to have more studies. I think um, this is also a reason why I think a model intercomparison um, effort is probably worthwhile and certainly another thing that we'd be happy to, you know, talk to you all about, because I think that's where we could start to diagnose, okay, well, what are the parts of this that all the models say they're say are, are going to happen? What parts do they disagree on? And maybe those are areas to focus in on more with, with more, um, you know, more energy. So I'm um, not sure I really answered your question, Ralph. <laughs> We're not actually doing any of this research. I just want to emphasize no, this is just, Greg, we, I'm we, a program we should, manager. <laughs> we should, we should talk more. I, I, maybe we'll yeah. take the opportunity to do that in the next few days. Yeah, sure, Ralph. Happy to hear from you anytime. So, yeah, um, there were some questions in the chat, but I don't know if what our timing is like, Richard. And I want to make sure Ava does I, speak. I think so. we should move on to our next speaker. I I think there were several uh, uh, questions about ozone, and I think that's coming up in in Eva's talk. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's move on then. So, th thanks very much, Greg. So, uh, Eva Bednars is our next speaker. Uh, she is a research scientist with. Uh, the Cooperative Institute for Research in the Environmental Sciences at uh, University of Colorado Boulder and the NOAA Chemical Sciences Laboratory. Uh, her talk is Stratospheric Aerosol Injection, Modeling the Impacts on Atmospheric Radiation, Dynamics, and Chemistry. Uh, hi, Richard. Thank you for having hi. me. Do you see my screen right now? Yes, very good. Okay, awesome. Thanks. So yes, thanks. I, Eva, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So. I would like to give you a brief 10 minute overview also of stratospheric aerosol injection. So this particular method, SRM method that we've been most, uh, so that I personally have been most involved in. And I wanna talk about, give you an interview uh, overview of what it is and some of the ways SAI can affect the atmosphere. I'm gonna try and focus it on the Arctic in particular and give you an example of some of the ongoing research that we've been going on looking at those effects. I why can't I? Give me a second. Okay. Okay. So since not all of you may be familiar, I just want to start with some background. So SAI bases on the injection of aerosol precursors into the lowest stratosphere. So most of the science so far has been done with sulfate aerosol, so the injection of SO2, which is a gas. And uh, once in the atmosphere, SO2 oxidizes to form sulfuric acid, which then either nucleates straight into the aerosols or co uh, condense and coagulates on pre-existing aerosols, either way eventually forming a layer of aerosols in the lowest stratosphere. And once formed, this layer of sulfate aerosols act to reflect a small portion of the incoming solar radiation and thereby reducing the surface climate. Now, importantly, this effect does not just cancel the greenhouse gas induced warming. And this is because there are important differences between the aerosol forcing, which is short wave forcing, and the greenhouse gas forcing, which is a long wave forcing. And this gives you an incomplete cancellation and can thus give you distinct climate impacts of stratospheric aerosol injection. 
And the other thing I want to point out is that sulfate aerosols, or most of the stratospheric aerosols that are now considered, are not just purely refractive, mm -hmm. but they also absorb a small portion of the outgoing terrestrial radiation, the small portion of the incoming solar radiation, giving you a warming in the lower stratosphere. And this is important because if you change temperatures in the stratosphere, you affect atmospheric circulation both in the stratosphere, but also in the troposphere below. Um, wow, well, it's too fast. And third thing I want to point out is that stratospheric aerosols, they also provide active surfaces on which chemical reactions can occur that otherwise happen very slowly in the gas phase. And this is again important because these reactions can change atmospheric concentrations of chemical species that are in directly important for ozone, as it was, uh, that was one of the questions in the chat, and I'm going to come back to that ozone, particular specifics of the ozone uh, changes in a second. But I want to go start going for some of the examples why those all processes matter. So one of the commonly discussed side effects of stratospheric aerosol injection is its impact on atmospheric circulation. So the plot here shows yearly mean changes in atmospheric temperatures from the surface to the top of the stratosphere. And this is on the left. On the right, I've got yearly mean changes in zonal winds. And these changes are, for an example, stratospheric aerosol injection where SO2 is being injected in the tropical low, in the equatorial lowest stratosphere. And this is compared to like fuzzy present day baseline period. So as I mentioned on my previous slide, sulfate aerosol absorb a portion of the incoming and outgoing radiation. And we see on the plot on the left that the um, resulting warming tends to maximize in the tropical lowest stratosphere. And this is, again, important as it changes meridional temperature gradients, giving you the strengthening of stratospheric zonal winds on both hemispheres. Now, you may ask, why do we care about changes in the stratospheric circulation? This is because during parts of the year, those stratospheric anomalies, they can actually propagate down to the troposphere and affect surface climates. And we see this uh, in the northern hemisphere, usually during wind. We can see this, well, in the northern hemisphere, this kind of propagation of stratospheric anomalies down to the troposphere normally takes place in winter. And what is found in the model simulations is this pattern of changes in sea level pressure on the left hand side, consisting of negative sea level pressure over the Arctic and increasing sea level pressure in the mid latitudes. And this is what is known as the positive phase of the North Atlantic oscillation. And what it does is that basically the tropospheric eddy driven jet that normally sits around 60 degrees north, so this is shown on the contours on the middle panel, this jet under SAI, this jet, this kind of SAI realization, it shifts poleward and the polar vortex contracts. And this has important, this kind of contraction of the tropospheric vortex has important consequences for winter temperature and precipitation patterns in Europe, Asia, and North America. An example of that is shown on the right hand side. We see this significant warming of the northern Eurasia region as the cold vortex moves more poleward and allows warmer air to uh, reach to come from the lower latitudes. Okay, so coming back to the ozone question. So another aspect that has also received a lot of attention lately is the SA, potential SAI impacts on stratospheric ozone. And um, as we all know, stratospheric ozone is crucial in shielding the air from the harmful UV radiation. And as Greg mentioned also in one of his slides, uh, the observed past ozone changes and its future projections and the range of greenhouse gas emission scenarios have been the subject of international assessment reports every four years under the umbrella of World Meteorological Organization. And the last report in 2022 was special as it was the first time SAI impacts were recognized and the were included in that report in a, actually a dedicated chapter. So now you may ask, why do we need the whole chapter? This is because the SA, potential SAI impacts on ozone are actually complex and they can occur in a number of ways. First, SAI would affect atmospheric concentration of chemical species that react with and destroy ozone. And this again can happen for a number of reasons. It's just purely because you change temperatures and circulation in the atmosphere, you change atmospheric chemistry, but also importantly, stratospheric aerosols provide active surfaces on which chemical reactions can occur that happen otherwise slowly in the gas phase. And this is very important for activation of stratospheric halogens in the lowest stratosphere, but it also plays a role for nitrogen oxide partitioning and hence both of those things could uh, then influence ozone chemistry. And the second thing is that stratospheric aerosol injection also could also impact the dynamical processes that are relevant for ozone. 
And this includes the changes in the large scale brewer, uh, large scale stratospheric transport, the so called brewer Dobson circulation. And this is on the plot in the middle. So, brewer the brewer Dobson circulation redistributes ozone from its production region in the tropical middle stratosphere to higher latitudes. And the third thing, so SAI could affect the tropospheric transport, and it can also, as I mentioned earlier, affect the strength of stratospheric polar vortex. And the any changes in the polar vortices in the stratosphere would be particularly important for polar ozone. And this is because if you have stronger polar vortex, in general, you have lower ozone column inside it. And we see on the plot on the right hand side, this effect is very strong in the Antarctic, but it's also plays an effect in the Arctic. It's just like an Arctic stratosphere is generally where more way more noisy, but it's still important. Um, uh, why? Sorry, the changing the slide is. So, okay, so the reason why I talk about all of those processes is that the final SAI induced ozone response is complex and actually reflects the SAI impacts on all of those processes. So the plot on the left hand side shows example changes in ozone during boreal spring, so March, April, May. For an example, a stratospheric aerosol injection occurring uh, with SO2 being injected in the lower stratosphere. And this is compared to the same period of the control simulation, which is the SSP2 simulation. So basically any changes we see here are only due to SAI. We don't have to worry about any changes in concurrent changes in the greenhouse gases or uh, ozone depleting substances. And now on the right hand side, I've got the inter integrated total ozone column changes in four different SAI simulations. So those four SAI simulations, they all achieve the same amount of global mean surface cooling, but they do so using a different location of injection, right? So traditionally, people look at SAI, they always injected aerosol at the equator. However, now there's more uh, people, there's more research being done, like, oh, what happens if you actually change the injection of the location? And we see that if you look at the impacts in the Arctic or the Northern Hemisphere extratropics, we see that SAI can actually both increase or decrease the Northern Hemisphere extratropical ozone columns, depending on how exactly it is implemented. And in this case, by talking about SAI implementation, I mean this particular case, the SAI location and timing, what people in this field often refer to as the SAI strategy. And this kind of like complex behavior be, arises because SAI strategies, different SAI strategies would impact the different chemical and dynamical ozone drivers differently, and that can give you a different ozone response. So again, there are lots of things going on, but like as an example, if you inject aerosols more in the tropics, the largest impact comes from changes in the stratospheric transport. Well, if you actually change uh, the aerosol injection location to the more like mid latitudes, then the enhance the role of the enhanced heterogeneous processing on stratospheric aerosols become more important. And this acts to offset the changes you get from changes in the stratospheric circulation. So you basically have lots of competing effects and really what kind of SEI is going to do to ozone is not really that easy to predict without addressing all the uncertainties and doing model simulations. Okay, so I want to fi fi uh, finish by moving down from the Arctic stratosphere to the Arctic surface. So as one of the speakers asked the question, like people, uh, well, most, lots of research has been done on the global mean changes, but, and ha it has been demonstrated that SAI could reduce the global mean surface temperature. However, apart from being effective at offsetting global mean surface temperature, a number of studies also looked at whether SAI could actually ameliorate some of the adverse greenhouse gas induced impacts that are specific to Arctic. And this includes the projected loss of uh, Arctic permafrost under rising greenhouse gases and the projected loss of Arctic sea ice. And in general, the answer is yes, those studies suggested that, well, showed, indicated that SAI could in fact ameliorate some of those risks as those kind of the Arctic specific risks like the loss of permafrost or the loss of Arctic sea ice. The research suggests those impacts are largely primarily radiatively driven. So if you cool the Arctic temperatures, you may also you can also help preserve Arctic permafrost or and Arctic sea ice. And this applies also to changes in the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, so AMOC. So if you don't know what it is, AMOC is the main thermohaline ocean circulation in the Atlantic that is crucial for first redistributing heat, but also redistributing nutrients, for especially in the Atlantic region, basin region, but also with links to like the rest of the globe. 
And you might be aware, most of the models project a decline in AMOC over the 21st century, as the Arctic warms is projected to warm, and which would facilitate less sinking of cold than salty waters that would otherwise drive the AMOC formation. And this is just like a result of our recent modeling studies that shown that by cooling the Arctic uh, region, SAI could, in, could also prevent the AMOC decline. However, the importantly, as with the other things, the extent to which is, this is actually true, to the extent to which this could actually slow down the AMOC collapse or even like help to restore it a little bit half higher would depend actually on the details of SAI realization. So in this case, the location of SAI injection. So here I've got all the different color lines are the different SAI injection locations. And the black line is the control SSP simulations. We see basically all sorts of different impacts on AMOC depending on where exactly the location of SAI, uh, where exactly the SO2 is being injected. Okay, so. I want to finish with some uh, conclusions. So I gave you a very brief in, uh, introduction to stratospheric aerosol injection and how that alters stratospheric and tropospheric temperatures with implications for the large scale atmospheric circulation, stratospheric ozone and surface climate, including some of those impacts uh, particular to the Arctic region. Now I try to make, I didn't have much time, but I try to make one point across is that SAI is not just, you, uh, we can't just think of SAI one th of, as one thing. The response to SAI is strongly dependent on the details of SAI reali realization. So I talked a lot, I talked uh, a bit about the role of the SAI location and timing, but it will also apply to the magnitude of SAI, to the underlying greenhouse gas emission scenario. It would also apply to like, most of the research has been done on sulfate aerosols, but also the the choice of aerosols, there's more research now looking at the alternative aerosols that would also uh, affect the response of climate system to the SAI. And I didn't have time to talk about it, but there are still many, many uncertainties that needs to be addressed. And one of them is because the response varies strongly across the models and is therefore influenced by model myth physics. And lastly, we need more research, really, to understand the atmospheric and climate response to stratospheric aerosol injection, its dependence on SAI realization. There's some also research being done that people try to optimize uh, this SAI realization that would uh, achieve, uh, well, first of all, explore, explore trade-off, but also devise an optimized uh, strategy where that tries to maximize the benefits and minimize side effects and risks. And also finally, there's really a lot of research needed to narrow down some of the uncertainties and also address the intermodal spreads. And with that, yeah, I just wanna thank you for your attention and giving me this opportunity to speak to you today. Thanks very much, Eva. Um, so just as clarification, most of your work uh, involves using CESM2 Wacom, is that right? With dynamic chemistry. I've done, most of the work, yeah, CSM, but also I've done lots of work with the UKSM model or like collaborating with people in the UK who use those simulations with the UKSM model. So most of the more well, well, simulations that I perform on my colleagues, they were with CSM, but we try to like extend the results also with the UK colleagues to the UKSM. But yeah, they have interactive chemistry, interactive dynamics and interactive ocean. Okay, Jack Dib, welcome. You could unmute, yeah. Oh, we can't hear you. I love your cat, though. <laughs> uh, no, can't hear you. Uh, do you want to do you want to take a minute to sort it? We'll go on to another question, then come back. Okay. Um, I think Mike McCracken was next. Um, I, I guess what I was curious about is, do you compare to how how much different it would be without SAI going ahead in some of these things? So, for example, on the on the ozone issue, are are you comparing to the to some baseline of the twentieth century or something like that, or are you comparing to what it would be without? with greenhouse warming, but without SAI. Uh, is that question just about ozone in particular or in general? Sorry, before I... Well, just in general. I, well, I'm interested in that ozone plot as well. well. I, mean, I wasn't clear what the 
I, I can't the remember what the both... baseline Dobson units are, and you showed departure from it, and I was just curious. Okay, now most of the analysis is done, like I've shown the ozone plot against the same period of the future period, because like that's just easier to understand what kind of SAI is doing. But like, no, most of the analysis, people look at, and myself included, at changes compared to the present day period, both with our SAI and without SAI. So it's important to like, when people talk about SAI, it's important to actually do it in terms of like risk, risk assessment. So yes, understanding like SAI is gonna come with some risk, but also like same climate change on its own. It's just like the ozone plot in particular was easier to understand if you have, if you forget about also the concurrent changes in the greenhouse gases and ozone depleting substances. But like, yeah, no, it's important to understand also what are the climate projections with greenhouse gases only without SAI and what are the risks we are currently set to face, even with like, well, it's important to mitigate as much as I can, but we, it's yeah. important to understand if we fail to mitigate, what are the risks and then what are the risks with higher greenhouse gases and also some SAI on top of that so that we can analyze the trades off. Yes. It, it would be interesting as well, just to say not to, to not just compare the mean values, but what the variability is in each of those situations, because of course there's going to be differences in the mean, but unless you know the range of variability in, in each of those cases, it doesn't really give you a sense of if it's a significant change or not. So. Thanks. Yeah, okay, and yeah, this is a very good oh, go point and we've been trying to do that too. Yeah, okay. So um, I, I really appreciate that you pointed at some of the subtleties involved in making, in even considering making some changes. But, you know, if you look at the models in some detail, you see that even for the global mean surface temperature, and even if they get the trends right, they don't get the magnitudes or the timing right, even for something like that. And so I'm wondering how far away you think we are in the modeling effort to a point where we have any confidence in the magnitudes of the effects, uh, such as the effect on ozone or the effect on regional temperature or the effect on precipitation and the water cycle. I mean, you can go on and on, all those things. How much confidence do you have that the model predictions will really reflect what will happen if we actually were to make any changes. So at the moment, I'm satisfactory. Having said that the amount of research and the progress I've seen over the last three, five years, because of like until like five, 10 years, the whole idea, like the stratospheric aerosol injection was really non-existent and then the kind of research that's been done has been not really taken seriously, but now because of the, you know, so as Greg shown so many, there's way more funding to do SAI research. So the amount of progress I've seen in like modeling developments and actually we start, people have started thinking of like, yes, we need more, we need to narrow the uncertainty. We need to look at more their intercomparison. We need to like, you know, better evaluate our models using the existing observations, which is the latest NOAA ERB call. So like we've started actually, so I would not feel confident to advise anyone right now based on our existing research. Having said that, the amount of progress people have done over like three, five years has been humongous. So if that's hopefully, um, if that continues, then hopefully that we shouldn't be too bad well, in the nearest future. <laughs> according to the IPCC, even the uncertainty in the global mean surface temperature trend, the, the climate sensitivity has not diminished in 40 years, despite all the things we've learned about clouds and aerosols. Well, yes, but at the same time, like we've already started seeing uh, negative impacts of climate change, right? So like to some extent, like the just the question on the magnitude of the global mean temperature change, in my opinion, is probably one of the it's important to understand from the practical sense and also for the impacts, but like the impacts are gonna be, is the local changes in regional temperatures that really are one of the biggest uncertainties. Because like if you, hypothetically, right? If one wanted to do SAI and somehow it turned out that instead of cooling the world by one Kelvin, we've actually only cooled the world by like half a Kelvin, that is not the biggest uncertainty. Uncertainty is what's gonna to happen to regional climate, uncertainty is gonna what happened to ecosystem. And these are the problems that actually, you know, are 
the most worrisome right now. If it's just half a Kelvin or is it one Kelvin, you can adjust the injection location. You can do something. It's the regional impact, not the global mean changes. I might that in my view needs to be addressed more urgently. Okay, it's coming up to the top of the hour. If you have someplace else that you need to be, um, we're going to continue on here for another uh, five or ten minutes here. Jack, if if your mic uh, is working now, yeah, we can. I'm not sure. Is it working? Yes, it is. Very good. Okay, well, I just typed the gist of my questions into the chat in case it wasn't working. But I mean, Mike raised a point that I was going to come after was, you know, and you mentioned it, that the different models give you vastly different results in some time. So, you know, do we really believe these models? And does just running the same model over and over again make us more confident? Personally, I realize I'm in a, a crowd. I shouldn't say this, but it doesn't do it for me. And so I was... Uh, <laughs> I'm wondering whether wrong. hopefully some are useful <laughs> right but right yeah can i can i jump in too ava because um you know just to your longer question there jack i mean yeah people are definitely using these kind of what they call experiments of opportunity to really um also test the ability of the models right and you know it's still mixed results right this is why we're doing research this is why we have a research program it's to try to narrow those uncertainties and you know, to, to Ralph's point, yeah, it's complicated and, and years of trying to do that with climate sensitivity, for example, it's still a tough problem. So, um, but, you know, I think that's part of why we're, we're trying to gather more observations that, that, you know, allow us to probe the models a little more, like really understand, well, is it something about the chemistry? Is it something about the dynamics? Is it something about, you know, whatever, the radiative properties of the aerosols? What is, what, you know, is it just that all models are, you know, they're all going to be wrong, like like Ava, Ava said, and we're never going to get, you know, we're never going to understand anything. But, you know, we know that large scale behavior, we can get some pretty good fidelity between a lot of different models, right? Um, the question is doing the finer scales. And, but that's exactly what the field needs to do. If we never talked about SRM, if we never mentioned that, we'd still have to get that kind of understanding from the models because it's the regional climate changes that are happening under anthropogenic climate change that is what people care about, right? Most of our climate mitigation strategies happen at lower, at, lo at more local scales, not internationally. So really that's where, that's the kind of questions we get is how good are your model predictions of climate change without the use of SRM? SRM just adds another wrinkle to it, but it's still the same fundamental physics and chemistry that we got to get right. And so I, I would say we still got to keep plugging away at it. That would be my my comment. OK, Tobias, uh, you had your hand raised earlier. Do you do you still want to ask your question? Sure, uh, I, I, I'm just a social scientist observing uh, the very, uh, uh, you know, conflict laden uh, technology we're talking about here. But I was wondering how shelf ready is the SAI uh, technology here? What are the resource requirements on a global scale and who decides when and where to do it? <laughs> oh, really great questions. Are, are you participating in the NSF workshops that are occurring right now, Tobias? No. <laughs> oh, <I'm> me. <laughs> yeah, I, I would encourage you to reach out there. Um, and, um, you know, look, there's a there's actually a host of literature on on the, the questions you just asked. Okay. So I couldn't possibly answer it all right at this moment. But these are really important ones. There is no internationally accepted governance structure, even for the research we're talking about. So that's part of why we have drawn a line in with what we're doing. We're fundament we're we're funding modeling work, laboratory work, and we're funding observations of the current state of the atmosphere. We are not funding experiments to go and put stuff into the atmosphere. We drew a line there, we're not doing that. Um, that doesn't mean that at some point Congress doesn't tell us or an administration doesn't tell us, Noah, we want you to do that too. That could happen, we're a federal agency, right? They're not there yet. <laughs> so, um, but I think it's a, a key question. Um, so, so yeah, I think we need to answer that. And, and I will contrast the state of the science for SRM, uh, the state of the situation for SRM, I should say, with that of CDR, carbon dioxide removal. So for example, the marine carbon dioxide removal approaches, if you go release anything into the marine environment, you gotta get a permit for that, at least if you do it in the United States. 
Um, you don't have to do that if you do if you're going to do SRM. You just got to tell Noah you're going to do it. That's all. But we don't offer you a permit or anything. We don't. We're not the gatekeeper. We're just the reporting mechanism. So I, I think these are the kinds of questions that would be really important for the community to work out prior to anybody really conducting such experiments. That said, Australia has had an active program to test technology uh, for marine cloud brightening for several years now with the goal of protecting the Great Barrier Reef. There's no large scale public outcry in Australia about that. The UK has been very public about its recent call from um, ARIA. So far, I haven't heard about a large scale pushback from their public. So, I, you know, I think it depends on how it's done and who does it. Um, what kind of reception this gets in the public arena. But, you know, you only have to read the newspaper here to know that there are a lot of concerns about this. <laughs> um, a lot of a lot of misconceptions about what what we are and are not doing. So I think I'll shut up now before I get myself into trouble. <laughs> and Edward, from your car. Oh, hi there. Yep, I'm just Dialing in on the way here. I'm really glad I didn't miss this. I really appreciate these two very interesting presentations on this. And I'm sorry, Jack Dibb had to go before I could answer him. Um, I work with a group at the Naval Research Lab that specifically works on uh, weather scale simulation of these events. So uh, that group in DC has published a series of papers over the last few years uh, diagnosing induced circulations in the lower stratosphere associated with natural injections of particles. And we have ongoing work to attempt to integrate our understanding of that phenomenon uh, at the weather scale so that we can actually include it in our weather prediction uh, of stratospheric circulation, our weather prediction of uh, atmospheric column forcings. Uh, and the point that Jack Dibb made uh, in his comment was about observation quality uh, and that is my point as well, uh, that I'm very interested in the activities of this community, because even though my research is not oriented whatsoever to SRM, uh, the understanding of this phenomenon, our ability to simulate it, uh, is rapidly going to bump up against the limitations of the observations, especially as we move to into the weather scale. Um, we have a lot, we have a big wish list of observations that would help us determine whether our uh, simulations are on point or not. Uh, so I'm very interested in hearing about the activities of this group and, and thank everybody for the presentations. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Edward. Uh, so just quickly, Greg, along those lines, um, the for NASA, the Aura mission um, is essentially winding down. So that's MLS and OMI. So in the future, there's going to continue to be some uh, ozone monitoring. There may continue to be some aer stratospheric aerosol monitoring, but uh, stratospheric chemistry, there's really nothing out there. There's nothing uh, under construction or even planned. Um, so do you think there's going to be a gap here for observations for remote sensing? Yeah, that's a great question, Richard. Um, so one of the things that will go away when MLS goes away is um, uh, water vapor profiles in the stratosphere. That's a very big one. It won't be, as far as I understand, fully replaced by any other capability by anybody else's um, mission. Um, the other one is some of the chemistry that's happening is, is still monitored by the ACE mission, but that is also a very aged mission, which, you know, um, probably will go away sometime in the near future. So, um, you know, so these concerns have been brought up in the community quite a bit in the remote sensing community. Um, there are others here who probably can comment better than I, but it's certainly a topic that's been elevated of, um, to for concern by the federal space agencies, and that includes NASA and NOAA. Um, we certainly are actively trying to make sure that we try to fill those gaps as quickly as possible. We do have, you know, there are measurements from international partners that can cover some of that ground, um, but there may be some gaps. And, um, you know, this is this is where, you know, having conversations like this is really important to build that awareness and then um, to alert agencies who have the, you know, who have the wherewithal, but also need, they need some lead time, right? It takes at least 10, if not 15 or 20 years to get a, a, a full satellite mission like these in, into space. Maybe those times will get shorter with small sats and, you know, um, different kinds of distributed architecture. 
Um, but even so, it takes time and of course it takes funding. And so there's also advocacy that we need to do, you know, um, with those who fund our, the research of the agencies in order to uh, get these missions funded. So, so I, it's really important you raise it. We try to raise that, th those same concerns like in our research agenda and others, as I said, have been raising these for a while now about the impending gap presented by the loss of a, pretty much the entire A train, right? All of the instruments that are on there that uh, we have relied on for so long. So, yeah. Okay, and then finally, uh, Eva. Um, so we talked about, or I, I talked about uh, the fact that there have been these historic uh, numerical experiments associated with with uh, SAI. So there are some like chronic results that they have. One is the changes in the tropical precipitation uh, location um, that, and perhaps you know, changing the monsoon and things like that. You showed precipitations for the mid middle and high latitudes. Can you say anything about, you know, what has been previously reported then about, you know, changes in, uh, in tropical convection associated with, I suppose it's associated with uh, hemispheric asymmetry in the, uh, in, in the application of SAI? Uh, yes. So one thing is tropical asymmetry part is just how much cooling there is in the tropics like historically lots of simulations just injecting in the equator which generally tends to overcool the tropics compared to other regions and yes changes historically lots of simulations did very crude SAI experiments when they just injected aerosols at the equator and yes that's if you change temperature gradients, both between the hemispheres, but also the temperature gradients between the equator and the high latitudes, you are gonna have a big impact on tropical precipitation patterns, both the magnitude and the location of Hadley circulation, the strength of the circulation. Having said that, people now started working on what well, this as one of this is like same kind of this is similar to what, what the other, like I talk about ozone, I talk about AMOC. This is another thing that is very dependent on the SAI realization. And people have started coming up with some more sophisticated SAI realization when they try to actually manage the interhemispheric temperature gradients, those large, large scale temperature changes so that you get as smooth uh, change in temperature as possible, right? And in those cases, in the grand scheme of things, the, those changes, those simulations minimize the temperature changes that would be associated with those, you know, large scale shift in the tropical circulation patterns. However, like, yes, there are still like some regional, you know, like there's still like the very regional changes that might still, you know, that are driven by more complex processes than, for instance, the shift in the Hadley circulation. But like, yes, people, the, the point is that people have now trying to actually do SAI better in a way that actually tries to realize that there are some problems and they actually, you can devise your SAI strategy, think about how to do it in a way that's going to get rid of those problems or at least minimize them. So. Okay, thanks. I now have 11 minutes after the hour. I have a lot of questions. I think everybody else has a raft of questions, but I think we should leave it here. Um, so I would like to, again, thanks very much to, to the presenters for, for their work in, in making the presentations and giving the presentations. And um, uh, Hazel, you're still on. Is there any other housekeeping that we should do? Um, no, I don't. Uh, I think the next uh, modeler's call is going to be focused on persistent modeling biases in marine biogeochemistry. That'll be coming up in a couple of weeks should be really interesting. Um, so please come back again for that. And uh, yeah, thanks again for joining. Thanks for the presentations and the, the good questions and discussion. Okay, thanks very much, everyone. Thanks everybody. Thank you, bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.